7. It's our goal to finish up the book tonight. So. so the first part of the book was a series of burdens or uh, declarations of coming judgment. The second part was a series of sermons. And this last part is this final three chapters. There's a series of visions that God gives to the prophet Amos. Uh, chapter 7, verse 1 says, Thus the Lord God showed me, behold, he formed locust swarms at the beginning of the late crop. Indeed, it was the late crop after the king's mowings. And so it was when they had finished eating the grass of the land that I said, O Lord God, forgive, I pray. O oh, that Jacob may stand, for he is small. So the Lord relented concerning this. It shall not be, said the Lord. So the very first vision that he's given is, is uh, a locust swarm. He's shown that. And, that, you know, since we recently studied the book of Joel, it kind of reminds us of that. But this is a different one here. This is a vision. It hasn't actually happened. God's showing him something that could happen. God used visions a lot in Bible times. Um, through various people, both Old and New Testaments, people would have visions. One of the famous ones in the New Testament is when Peter saw the vision of the sheet and all the animals inside, and God communicated a couple things through that. You know, number one, it's okay to have a BLT now. It's kind of taken from that. But also that God wanted uh, the church to reach out and evangelize and preach the gospel to the Gentiles. And so God, God uses visions. And basically what a vision is, is it's a dream while you're awake. And, and so God can speak through dreams. God can speak through visions. And he gave, uh, he, he gave visions here to Amos as a prophet. And, and they had a message and he was supposed to deliver the message to the nation. And the message was this, God's going to deal severely with this nation. And he would send a locust plague to the crops. And, and what's interesting is what the way he names which crops. He says that it'll be to the, the late crops that would be attacked. There were early and later crops. The first crops went to the king. He got the first, he got the first batch. And then there were the later crops, and those you know, were for everybody else. It was for the farmer himself to make his, you know, to be able to sell and, and then just and for the people. And the vision was that this locust plague would come on the late crops and that the people and the cro those crops would be devastated by these locusts. And one of the things that, that would communicate through that God was trying to say is that, you know, a lot of time, and we know this today, we know this to be true right now in the times that we live, a lot of times we look at our leaders and we, and we blame everything on leaders. As if they are the only ones who are responsible or accountable to what goes on in a nation. That, that whatever they do, it's their fault. Whatever happens, it's their fault. As if, you know, the, the culture and the people have nothing to do with anything. And God, by bringing this judgment to the crop that would affect the people, was making it clear, that's not how I see it. Surely the leaders have accountability before God to the decisions they make, and, and they have a lot to answer for. But the nation, you know, uh, especially in, in our country, the, uh, the culture produces the kind of leaders that we have, both ways. And, and so we should never just think that we're all blameless and everything would be perfect if it wasn't for our, set, our messed up leaders. Yeah, they came from us. And, and we need to remember that. We need to remember that when we're, you know, thinking about things. We also need to remember that in light of the fact that we, because a lot of times we put so much weight on the leaders, we think that anything that could be changed and made better is on them as well, which is why we as Christians remember we need to repent. It's not on, it's not just on them. And so um, anyway, because it was a vision, Amos watched it unfold somehow. I don't know how exactly how that works. It looks like a dream, but you're awake, you know, movie. I don't know. But he's watching this whole thing, and, and he sees it, and it's terrible. And so he understood what the vision meant and, and it, that it was what they deserved. And so what did he do? He prayed. He prayed. And, and how awesome, because God 
answered the prayer. God relented. He didn't go through with it. Take note of that. Believe that. That God does that. That he'll answer our cries for mercy. There's, you know, we, there's, I don't know if, if it's a hopeless cause yet. We'll get it through the chapter here for our country. But we know that God, you know, he'll, he'll answer the cries of his people for mercy and, and repentance. And this is just the prayer of one of just the prophet Amos himself. And God's like, I'm going to send this locust plague. And he prays and, and God doesn't do it. And so remember that in, in our prayers. Uh, they're, worth, they're worth praying. Verse 4, Thus the Lord God showed me, Behold, the Lord God called for conflict by fire, and it consumed the great deep and devoured the territory. Then I said, O Lord God, cease, I pray. O that Jacob may stand, for he is small. So the Lord relented concerning this. This also shall not be said the Lord God. So we have here a second vision. This one is fire, a terrible great fire. It doesn't give a lot of detail. One thing that it says here is very interesting. It says that uh, uh, it says, uh, and it consumed the great deep and devoured the territory. And the thought is that this is one of those fires that's so bad that, you know, water, you know, it just burns through a lake or something like that. Or you know, you have a fire so bad that even when it rains, it doesn't get put out. That's how, bad, that's how terrible the fire was. And, and God was saying something like that. He was saying that that's, that's what's coming. And again, Amos prayed. <clears throat> and once again, God relented. And so, uh, you know, even if, even if, the, even if what the nation is going through is one disaster after another, kind of like what we're seeing in the last 10 months now. Uh, keep praying, keep asking, God uh, intervenes. Uh, but then verse 7, it says, Thus he showed me, behold, the Lord stood on a wall made with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not pass by them anymore. The high places of Isaac shall be desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. I will, ra- I will rise with the sword against the house of Jeroboam. Uh, and that would be the, the king of, uh, of the northern region. Um, so this next vision God gives Amos is, he, he so- shows him something, he says, what do you see? So he asks him, and he says, a plumb line. You know, he's a farmer, he knows something, he's not, he's not dumb, he, it's a plumb line. Well, what's a plumb line? Well, a plumb line, <clears throat> back before we had fancy levels and lasers and things, is they still use them, but it's a string. And you take a string, and it's got a point, a weighted point at the end that you, you hold up, and, and you used it to find out if something was plumb. Well, what does plumb mean? Well, plumb is like the vertical version of horizon, of level. Levels this way. Plum is this way. Is it straight up and down? And we use levels now. You can put the level because the level's got a bubble on it, mostly. But you can you would use a plum. And what it would tell you is, you know, is the wall of the house or a beam or a post or the fence post straight? And you want to know that because if it's not straight, it weakens the strength of the structure. You got a wall on your house that's out like that, that house is is weaker. The roof could cave in. It, cave in. it, it could collapse. It, it would weaken things, and, and you don't want it to have it happen that way. And, and what God was doing by showing this plumb line is God's the one who built the nation of Israel. He's the builder of it. And he gave, he gave it, he, gave, he made it plumb. He gave his law to make it, and his word, and his promises, and his covenant to make it straight to make it strong, and he built it that way. And now he says, take this plumb line and now take a look at it. And, and what, they, what, it, what it would show is that when you, if you take God's word and God's word is the plumb line and you see the structure of the nation, you would, God would, was showing uh, Amos and wanted the people to know, you guys are completely out of line. You're, you're all crooked, you're all tweaked, and... And you can't stand like that. And, and so he showed them that, and he said, and, 
and I'm not going to pass by them anymore. The time of mercy is now over. So those prayers for mercy are good, but without a repentance to go along with the asking of mercy, there's, they're only going to go so far. We can't just, you know, you know that whole fool me once, shame on, shame on me, fool me twice, shame on you. Well, God's not going to fall for that. He's merciful, but we can't just keep going, oh, I, we did really bad, but I asked for mercy again, so God's just going to keep giving me, like, like it's a sin all you want, you know, thing to do that you just pray and then that's all. There has to be repentance. And, and God shows with the plumber, and there's no repentance here. And, and uh, when we see our own lives, and it's not hard to tell if we're honest before God with his word, and we look at his word, and we're reading his word, and we see our life, and we, it, we can tell, am I out of plumb or am I, am I lined up with God? We know. And if we see it out of plumb, if we see ourselves out of line, that's the time to repent and receive his mercy because he's not going to let it go on like that forever. He'll do something severe. He'll deal with it because if he doesn't, right? Look at you again, you have your house, the wall of your house is totally out of plumb. It's not just an inconvenience. That thing's going to collapse and cause way more damage. And so before, God won't let that happen. He's like, well, I'm going to deal with it. And so he, he showed them. That's what time it had become in the nation, that, they're, that this, they were so out of line that it was time where God was like, I, I'm not going to just pass it off with mercy anymore. I'm going to deal severely. Verse 10, Then Amaziah the priest of Bethel sent to Jeroboam king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall be, surely be led away captive from their own land. Then Amaziah said to Amos, Go, you seer, flee to the land of Judah. There eat bread and there prophesy, but never again prophesy at Bethel. It is the king's sanctuary, and it is the royal residence. And so, now... Remember, Bethel was one of the key towns. It was where, in the northern kingdom, it was where the, one of the golden calves was set up. It was a center of idolatry, and they, they even had their own priesthood set up. Remember, uh, the, or this is Jeroboam the second, but the first Jeroboam, he set it all up because the kingdom was divided, and he didn't want people going down to uh, uh, Jerusalem anymore to worship. So he set up this whole thing totally against God. God did not approve of any of this. He wasn't okay with any of it. He wasn't okay with the golden calf. He wasn't okay with the temple in Bethel. He was definitely not okay with the priesthood. None of it was God-ordained. This was all completely in rebellion to God. And yet here it was, and it was all fancy, this fancy religion, and it was all involved in everything. And so one of the priests from there, here's this hick named Amos preaching. And he goes, and he goes and tells the king, this guy's inciting rebellion against you. He's, he, he's conspiring against you. He's preaching against you. And the things he's saying, they're not good. We need to shut this guy up. He can't be saying the things he's saying. And so he, 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 uh, he's saying that, you know, we're going to be conquered and you're going to be taken out and all these things. And and then Amaziah says to Amos, you need to get out of here. How dare you speak against the king? This is the king's sanctuary. You have no right. I'm trying to scare him off. That's what he's trying to do. You know, who do you think you are speaking to the king like this? And, and here's how Amos answered verse 14. It says, then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor was I a son of a prophet. But I was a sheep breeder and a tender of sycamore fruit. And as we mentioned earlier, that's a type, there's a type of fig. And, and then the Lord took me and I followed the flock. And the, and the Lord said to me, go prophesy to my people Israel. And so here in the first part of 
Amos' answer to this Amaziah guy, this priest, he's like, look, man, I was minding my own business being a farmer. I, this isn't something I motivated myself to do. This wasn't my ambition in life. I was a farmer, and God called me. God told me to come here. Why would anyone sign up for something like this? You guys all hate me. And, and, he, and, and, and remember, he's saying this. The, the guy Amaziah, this would be like the equivalent of, of some just nobody from the Central Valley you know, going to some the biggest church in California and because God wants him to go rebuke the pastor there, or even a, a denomination, and, and like this guy's like probably all seminary trained and everything, and he's like, God just told me to come say this. The only reason I'm doing it is because God told me, I, I didn't ask for this. It would have been much easier for me to just keep farming. And he's all, but God told me to. And, and, and here's the thing. Amos totally believed that. There's no way he does what he does <laughs> unless God told him and he knows God told him. And that's why he did it and wasn't afraid. And that's why he kept doing it. Because as inconvenient as it might have been easier to go back home and farm. But he knew God told him to do it. There's no better reason to do what we do than God tells us to do it. If God calls you to do something, that is all you need. It doesn't matter what anyone else thinks of you. It doesn't matter if you're just a nobody. It doesn't matter whether you're from, you know, how much education background you have. By the way, there's nothing wrong with education. There's nothing wrong with training. But it's not the highest requirement. The, the biggest requirement is did God call you to do it or not? And, and so in the face of this, Amos you know, he might have been tempted like so many people are. When it starts getting hard, it's like, why do I have to go through this? But, but it always settles on that biggest thing, and that's because God told me to. And, and so uh, that's what he does. It's not always easy, but when God tells us to do what he tells us to do, we got to do it. Verse 16, so he says all that to the guy. He's like, I'm, I know I'm nobody, but God told me to. Now, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. So in light of that, God told me, here's what, here's what you need to hear. You say, do not prophesy against Israel and do not spout against the house of Isaac. But therefore, thus says the Lord, your wife shall be a harlot in the city. Your sons and daughters shall fall by the sword. Your land shall be divided by survey line. You shall die in a defiled land and Israel shall surely be led away captive from his own land. And so having laid out plainly that he was just delivering the message that God gave him, he was doing what God told him to do, now God has him deliver a severe message specifically to this guy. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't take this as a, well, you said something mean to me, so now I'm going to say something even meaner to you. you know? We shouldn't take it to be like, oh yeah, well, you, know, you threatened, well, let me, hear, let me give you a threat back. It, that's not it at all. The reason why this message is so severe, and it's severe specifically against Amaziah, is because he's a false prophet. And God hates false prophecy. He hates false teaching. He hates peop when people try to say they're speaking in his name and they're telling lies in his name. He ha God hates that. And some of the harshest words in the entire Bible are against people that do that. Jesus unloaded more than any, on anyone else than, as he did against the, the uh, scribes and the Pharisees because they were teaching falsely. They were misrepresenting God. Jesus had a lot of patience. We know that. He was very kind. But when it came to that kind of sin, and then... And then so many others, in fact, we're, as we study through 2 Peter, in chapter, once we get to chapter 2, the chapter deals with that uh, severely. And, and so, um, God hates spiritual counterfeits. He hates lies spoken in his name. So that's why this guy's getting reamed like this. It's, it doesn't have anything to do with him like, you know, Okay, Amos, he said something mean to you. You say something mean back. This was the message the guy was going to get either way. 
Chapter 8, verse 1, Thus the Lord God showed me, behold, a basket of summer fruit. And he said, Amos, what do you see? So I said, a basket of summer fruit. Then the Lord said to me, The end has come upon my people Israel. I will, not, I will not pass by them anymore. And the songs of the temple shall be wailing in that day, says the Lord God. Many dead bodies everywhere. They shall be thrown out in silence. And so another vision, this basket of summer fruit, simple things. What, what is summer fruit like? It's ripe, right? That's when it's ripe. Yet the early spring fruit, it's not ripe yet. It's ripe. It's ready. There, no, it doesn't need to stay anymore. There's no more delay. It's ready to be picked, to be harvested. And God was showing the nation they were ripe. There's no more waiting. Jud they, were, they were ripe for judgment. The season of waiting was over. The end of the crops was at hand. And God was saying, it's over for them. Same message that he gave through the plumb line vision. Uh, there's no more passing by. There's no more mercy now. That time is over. They're ripe for judgment. And, and, then, and then he speaks about the, the violence that would come upon the land. And notice he mentions the temple. And again, this is the false temple. This is the temple that God did not ordain. This is the spiritually rebellious temple in Bethel. And, and God says there's going to be wailing, not singing. There's going to be dead bodies there. And, and the reason why that would be noteworthy is because the pagan religions, the false, you know, the, the, the religions, they typically believed that any battle, that any war that happened between nations was really a battle between gods. Our God versus your God. That's how they thought of it. And if that was the case, then the, the, they also believed in territorial gods. And so the place that your God would be the most strong would be his temple. That's, where the, that's, that's what they believed. And, and so what God's saying is, I'm going to put that lame idea to rest. Your, your temple's going down. What you believe about it is going down. And, and so... Um, over and over, the judgment of God happens, you know, in that kind of way. And what God, what God, one of the things God communicates is that whatever it is that you think that you can depend on and trust in and look to and, and lean on that isn't me, I have to destroy that. I, ha you're, you, I can't let you keep, and, and so here they are believing in this false system with their temple and their golden calf. And God's like, that's going to go. You can't keep trusting in that. And so he would do that in Israel. He does that in our lives. He's not going to let us continue. It's, if we're his people, he, he's not going to just let us continue to trust in and hope in and depend on and lean on something to the neglect of our trust of him. He's not going to do that. Verse 4 Hear this, you who swallow up the needy and make the poor of the land fail. One of their great sins was their greed and their uh, injustice towards the poor. He says, saying, when will the new moon be passed? This is what the, 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 uh, the rich and greedy people would think. When will the new moon be passed that we may sell grain and the Sabbath that we may trade wheat, making the ephah small and the shekel large? falsifying the scales by deceit, that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, even sell the bad, even sell the bad wheat. And so God is calling out the way that they acted and the way that they were greedy. And one of the ways that they would show their greed and their corruption was, now the new moon was a monthly celebration. So you had the Sabbath weekly, you had the new moon monthly. And they would have, and it was a holy day, so it was a day for no work. And so they would have these times of, uh, they were having worship, that it was supposed to be a day dedicated to God. But God, God knows the hearts of people. And so what he would see is he'd see these people go, why do we got to waste this? Why can't we just go work and make more money today? So 
Picture it like this. Picture somebody in church. How long is this going to go on? When can I go and get my lunch? When can I go back and play my games? When can I get out of here and go watch another movie? God sees all that. He's not fooled by that. God, God saw them, and yeah, they were there for their, their uh, new moon day, but he knew where their hearts were at in it. He knew that they weren't into it. He knew that the whole time all they wanted to do was get out of there and go make more money. And he knows the same with us. And it's, you know, there's always been ways to, to act like we're, you know, involved. Now it's super easy because we got these phones. And who would know if you're looking at your Bible or looking at Instagram while you're at church? Who would know? You might be looking at your Bible. How would anyone know? Unless somebody's sitting right next to you looking. And, but he, he calls them out on that. He goes, I know, I know where your heart is. I know what you're like. And, and he knows, you know. Everybody else in, in the whole place might, oh, yeah, he's always at church. He's always into, you know, he's there. He's listening. He's got his Bible open. But God knows if we're listening, if we're letting him speak to our heart, if we're like, he knows. And if, and if, if we're just going through the motions and we're really his, then he's got to deal with us. And this kind of thing was rampant in their time, and it's probably rampant in our time. I wouldn't know. I see it once in a while. But it doesn't matter what I see. God knows. Verse 7, The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, Surely I will never forget any of their works. Shall the land not tremble for this, and everyone mourn who dwells in it? All of it shall swell like the river, heave and subside like the river of Egypt. And so, verse 7 is kind of chilling. I will never forget any of their works because they had not repented, because they wouldn't listen to God. God is now going to deal with them. And, and because they hadn't repented and they hadn't come to him for his mercy and forgiveness, their sins were still upon them. And, and he said, I will never forget. And one of the things that that tells us is, you know, Okay, God, so God never forgets, but it also tells us, you know, sometimes you feel like, okay, I did this bad thing, but it was a long time ago. And we, we can fool ourselves into thinking that I'm fine, that was a long time ago. But if you haven't repented of it, time doesn't wash away our sins. Jesus washes away our sins. Time doesn't. It, it, we have, you know, try, try that with any bill collector. Try that with any of the bills you owe. Oh, man, I made that charge like three years ago. You don't still expect me to pay that, do you? Like you go out and you use your credit card, you buy something. Try that. How's that going to go? We know it's not going to go. God's holy. He's perfect. He's just. He doesn't, wa he doesn't want to punish us for our sins, but he can't excuse sin. So it's easy to repent and just be forgiven, but to think that, you know, yeah, I, this, all this sin was so long ago, and it doesn't even matter anymore. The problem with that, for us, is that we think, you think we're just going to do that once? What, what happens if the credit card doesn't chase you down? Oh, I'm fine, I can go charge more, right? Oh, they're not even going to bother me. I can go, this is great. I can go charge more. We think we just get away with our sin and we don't have to come clean with God and be forgiven. What, what do you think we're going to do? Well, we're sinners. We're going to go do it some more. Oh, yeah, I never got in trouble last time or the time before. Everything's fine. God probably doesn't even care. He cares about the condition of our heart and our soul. Now, the beautiful thing about all this is that in Jesus Christ, here, surely I will never forget any of their works. In Jesus, he says, your sins and your lawless deeds I'll remember no more. I'll cast them in the depths of the sea. As far as the east is from the west, I'll remove your sin from you. That's what he offers. That's what he offers. And so... Though we're, you know, our sins are scarlet, we're 
will be as white as snow in Jesus. Why wouldn't we repent? Why wouldn't we just turn? He hates our sin, and yet he offers perfect forgiveness and mercy and help. The, 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 the fact that we're so, so often unwilling to repent or don't want to, it, it should remind us that's how desperately I need to because of a sinner I am. Clearly, this thing's got a grip of my heart. And so, how good we have our sins completely forgotten by the Lord in Jesus. So let's just remember that quick repentance. Verse 9, And it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord, that I will make the sun go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in the broad daylight. I will turn your feasts into mourning and all your songs into lamentation. I will bring sackcloth on every waist and baldness on every head. I will make it like mourning for an only son and its end like a bitter day. And so declaring that he would not forget their sin, now he says what he will do in their judgment. There is a day of darkness coming, he says. Uh, They liked their spiritual darkness. God said he would bring an actual darkness an eclipse, maybe, I don't know, on the day of judgment. Um, some of this is, I think, um, some of that type of prophecy where there would probably be a near fulfillment, and then a lot of this applies to the very end times where God's going to j- bring this kind of judgment on the world. And, and so and there's, a great, there's a time of great darkness coming on the world. And it's not hard to see. We already live in spiritually dark times. We already live in morally dark times. Men love darkness more than light because their deeds are evil. And so uh, there's a day coming, and and it's going to be a day of uh, terrible mourning. Verse 11, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, but it sh- but shall not find it. In that day, the fair virgins and the strong young men shall faint from thirst. Those who swear by the sin of Samaria, who say, as your God lives, O Dan, and as the way of Beersheba lives, they shall fall and never rise again. So here's a... Uh, Powerful, again, he's just declaring the judgment that would come um, because of their sin. But one of the most interesting things here is this famine of hearing the word of God. Not, not a famine of bread, that's bad enough. Not a famine of, of water, that's terrible enough. And it's not even a famine, notice the way it's worded. It's not a famine of God speaking. It doesn't say that. It's a famine of hearing. That's where the lack will be. God's, and the famine of people hearing his word. And God says he's going to send it. So, wait a minute, you're not going to let them hear? Yes. And here's why. Because they weren't listening anyway. This is similar to what God did with Pharaoh. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. And then God finally said, well, I'm going to give you over to that. And, and God settled him in that state of hardness of heart. He's, that's what he wanted. God said, fine, have it your way. Have a hard heart. And, and these people, they weren't listening. I mean, prophet after prophet, not to mention they already had the word of God, and they wouldn't listen to it. They were plugging their ears to the word of God. And so finally God said, okay, I'm going to make it so, they, so that you can't hear me. And then, there, and then he describes the situation where like, well, but we need to hear, we need wisdom cry, we need to tell, tell us what to do, God, tell us what to do. Why would he? We don't do that. Why would, you know, we're, if somebody ignores us long enough and it doesn't take that long, you, you realize, well, I don't have anything to say to you. You don't listen to me anyway. And, and so it's interesting, though, they would still 
seek to hear. They want the benefits. They realize the benefit that God, wow, God speaks to us. And that is a a great blessing. It's a great benefit that God speaks to us. But it does no good to just be religious about that. It being a hearer of the word does no good. We're supposed to be doers of it. And they wouldn't, they weren't being doers of it. And what's crazy is they had this thing where even though they wouldn't listen to God, they still went and claimed to have a relationship with him. Well, that doesn't work in any relationship. It doesn't work for very long. You know, here you have a relationship and, you're, and you just never listen to him. You just nod and smile. You know, sometimes we get tired and that, we just pass that off because we're just tired. But you can't do that. You can't do that in an ongoing way. God is gracious to speak to people. Hearing his word is a privilege. It's a blessing. And so we need to listen to it. And they became spiritually famished because they wouldn't. David Guzik pointed out something important to think about here, I think. Um, Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so a famine of hearing the word of God literally starves us to death because we live by his word. We don't live by just bread. That's not, that's not living. Without hearing the word of God, and thinking about it, and believing it, and praying it, and meditating it. We're not living. We're spiritually starved. And he wants us to listen to him. Verse 1, I saw the Lord standing by the altar. And he said, strike the doorposts that the thresholds may shake, and break them on the heads of them all. I will slay the last of them with the sword. He who flees from them shall not get away, and he who escapes from them shall not be delivered. Though they dig into hell, from there my hand shall take them. Though they climb up to heaven, from there I will bring them down. And though they hide themselves on top of Carmel, from there I will search and take them. Though they hide from my sight, At the bottom of the sea, from there I will command the serpent, and it shall bite them. Though they go into captivity before their enemies, from there I will command the sword, and it shall slay them. I will set my eyes on them for harm and not for good. And again, that's another really chilling statement. But here's just this summary. God's saying in a variety of ways, that um, this judgment is going to come and nobody's going to escape it. There's not going to be anywhere to run. There's not going to be anywhere to hide. It's not like God's going to overlook somebody. Oh, they, they got away. You know, during human wars, people are able to hunk, sometimes hunker down and hide out and survive that way. And, and God says... This judgment won't be like that. I mean it. It's, there's no escape from it. Something interesting there as he says all this is in verse 2, though they dig to hell, from there my hand shall take them. You know, nobody escapes God. Nobody does. A person wants to live their whole life in rebellion against God, in neglect of God, or, you know, trying to run away from God, then you die. And you still have to stand before God. And then you go to hell. And hell isn't outside of the realm of God. God is everywhere. He's omnipresent. But what it is outside of is it's outside of the realm of his grace and his life and his blessing. And people will be in hell very aware of God in his holiness. And may that motivate us to reach out to people desperately. They're not hiding from God. So we, we want to pray that we're 
just more effective in reaching people. Verse 5, the Lord God of hosts who touches the earth and it melts and all who dwell there mourn, all of it shall swell like the river and subside like the river of Egypt. He who builds his layers in the sky and uh, most of the commentators had trouble trying to figure out what that means uh, and, his, and has founded his strata in the earth who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. Are you not like the people of Ethiopia to me, O children of Israel, says the Lord? Did I not bring up Israel from the land of Egypt, the Philistines from Kaftor, and the Syrians from Kerr? Behold, the eyes of the Lord God are on the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from the face of the earth. Yet I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, says the Lord, for surely I will command and will sift the house of Israel among the nations as grain is sifted in a sieve, yet not the smallest grain shall fall to the ground. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, who say the calamity shall not overtake nor confront us. And so here God is doing a few things. First of all, he's reminding them who they have offended, who they have rebelled against, so that they're reminded, you've offended and rebelled against the God who melts the earth, the God who made the sky and the weather and, and, you know, and all these things, and you, you've come against him. He's the one that you've reckoned with. It's not, it's not just you've got these military enemies. It's not just, you know, a political offense. Oh, you offended the left or oh, you offended the right. Sin's always an offense against God first, this powerful God. And then he reminds them what they've been like. And remember, this this is his people and he tells them, you become like everybody else. You're just like Ethiopia. They were a pagan nation. You're just like the Philistines. You're just like the Syrians. And, 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 and he tells them that, that they were as terrible as everybody else. And, and God said, you're going to be sifted. And this is really interesting. This is another theme uh, that comes up in uh, uh, 2 Peter chapter 2. We're, we'll get to that. Where God basically says, I'm going to sift the nation. And I know how to sort you guys out. I know there's some that are still faithful. I won't let one grain of wheat fall to the ground. This is, this is why we, you know, one of the things that led me to pray before the service where we were praying, you know, Lord, please don't just, you know, his people are, God's people are uh, stretched and refined, but he also knows how to make a difference. He knows the difference. He knows who's faithful to him and, and who isn't. God isn't fooled by, you know, our church attendance and our, you know, rebellious hearts. He wasn't offend. He wasn't tricked by them being, oh, but I'm an Israelite. He he knew who was wicked, who was in rebellion against him. And, and, And one of the things that's good to know that about is it just reminds us that God, he knows us so well. He knows us so much better than we know ourselves. He knows exactly where we're even before going down a wrong path, he knows what will lead us to a wrong path. So we stick with him because we want him to show us those things. We want him because he's so good at sifting and seeing everything perfectly, you know, and his, his word divides between bone and marrow, you know, soul and spirit. He knows the heart of everything and he knows our hearts. So we want to stick close to him so that he'll reveal what needs to be revealed, even if it's ugly and painful in our own hearts, so that we can get that in under grace, get that in under mercy, get that in under, you know, help me, Lord, I'm sorry, I'm weak, you know, in that as as opposed to him having to deal with us as rebels. And, And so it's just good to know that. We want the Holy Spirit to show us our hearts. 
And, and, and then when we're wrong, we, we turn and appeal to his grace and his, his correction. And he knows exactly how to do that. We, we, when we're watching everything unfold around us, we don't know exactly how that works. At the very same time, some people are being condemned. They're being hardened in their rebellion at the same, and through the exact same means, God can also soften us, bring us to a place of brokenness so that we'll real repent, refine us, purify us. You know, it's like that saying, the, the, the same sun uh, melts the wax and hardens the clay. And he, and he knows the difference. Verse 11, On that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and repair its damages. I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Eden, Edom and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does this thing. That little mention of Gentiles called by his name, that's us. But, but um, this is one of the most amazing and encouraging things about God. These last few verses in the book, I mean, and it's been heavy, you know, it's been a message of judgment and call to repentance and all those things. But God does this same thing over and over in his word. Destruction is not the last word. Judgment is not what God wants to end on. That's not the final word. There's life after death. God is the God of restoration. He's the God of redemption. He's the God of resurrection. He's the God of renewal. He's the God who wants to rebuild. You know, go to that, go to that, go to a building and you bring out the plumb line and you're like, these walls are all out of whack. What has to happen? They need to be knocked down. And maybe, why are they out of whack? They found out, well, even the foundation's jacked up. What needs to happen? It needs to be gotten rid of. Now, you could stop there and go, okay, that's the end of that whole thing. It's condemned. It's destroyed. The hospital I was born in, actually right by Sergio's house, it's gone. That, you know, because I think part of the thing, it was so old, it, you know, just, they just got rid of it. Now, you know, they build condos and everything like they do everywhere else. But, you know, they just got rid of it. God doesn't want to just get rid of things. He wants to restore and he has plans to restore even before the destruction. It, so, sometimes he gets to the point where he's like, the only solution is to tear this thing down and rebuild it. And that's hard. But he doesn't want to just leave it destroyed. That's why he flooded the world but saved Noah. It's like, I'm going to start over. God wants to save but sometimes the conditions are so bad that the only way forward is to do some really strong demolition work. And, and uh, I don't know where we're at in this country, but I hope that's not where we're at. Pray that that's not where we're at. Make sure that's not where you're at individually. And the more, you know, and, and, but God won't leave it to where there's nothing. When, when the severity comes, it's because that's just the way it's got to go forward. Because he, his ultimate goal is redemption, restoration, and rebuilding. Verse 13, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper. What an awesome picture. So what he's saying is, the harvest and the crops going to be so huge that they're barely going to be done reaping the harvest while it's time to plow for next season. It's going to be, you know, imagine that. You're like, you're planting your garden, and you know, usually at the end of the season, the plants are all dead, and so you're like, you got some time in between. But he's saying the during the time of restoration, there's going to be such fruitfulness in the land that you're barely going to have enough time to reap all the harvest and it'll be time to plant again. And, and so he's painting this picture of, again, even after this judgment, even after there's, a, there's an ultimate time coming, the mountains shall drip with sweet wine and all the hills shall flow with it. I will bring back the captives of my people Israel. 
They shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink wine from them. They shall also make gardens and eat fruit from them. I will plant them in their land and no longer shall they be pulled up from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. And the beautiful thing is, is so much of that is fulfilled now and still being fulfilled. And, and the, the blessing that that gives us is that anytime you see a fulfilled prophecy in the Bible, it just reminds you anything that hasn't been fulfilled yet will be. He, he keeps his promises. Now, these will ultimately be fulfilled when Jesus comes back completed, but they're already being fulfilled now. I don't know. That's a good word to end on because, again, I don't know where, our, I don't know where this country's going. No idea. I'm not, I don't have that kind of prophecy. But I know that no matter what happens, Jesus is still coming. He's still going to reign on this earth for a thousand years, and we're going to be with him. That's still going to happen. Father, we thank you for your word. We love you. We need you. We want you to search us. Lord, we again, once again, ask that we would not have to repeat so many things in history and so many other nations before that have turned from you, that have just been so wicked that you couldn't let it continue. We pray for your mercy and grace. We pray for revival within the church, among your people. And we pray, pray for an awakening. We pray for you to hold back the evil, the violence that some would bring, the destruction that some would bring on this country, Lord. We pray that people would be peaceful towards each other. Help us to do that, Lord. Bless our church, Lord. Protect our people. Keep us healthy. Keep us close to you. Bless every home and every family and every heart. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.